Hi folks, it's Andy. Welcome to this week's Kendo Rant. Uh, I've got loads of questions to get through today, uh, but before I do, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, all that sort of thing. Join the Kendo Show Early Access Group. There's a link in the description down below. Most of the questions from today's episode actually come from uh, the Early Access Group. It's a great place to post your questions um, because it's not just uh, me that answers them here. There's a great community of Kendall Car from all over the world. So make sure you're in that group. Uh, the link's in the description down below. And finally, don't forget, if you do like uh, this channel, if you like the video that I, the videos that I put out, the content that we do, uh, whether it's this uh, Kendall rant, whether it's the analysis videos, had a great analysis video last week where we looked at a grading done in Nito, um, whether it's Kendall Gamer or any of the other things that we put out there, don't forget to shop at kendostar.com because <laughs> that's uh, that's what supports the channel. That's what makes sure that makes sure that it can happen. Uh, that's my company. It sells fantastic, amazing, wonderful, brilliant, uh, stupendous, and all the other good words. Uh, Kendo equipment, um, and it ships around the world free of charge. So make sure you get to kendostar.com to do your Kendo shopping. Best rated Kendo shop on the internet. So let's get right into the question. It says, Andy, I noticed that all of my hackama eventually will somehow roll out at the outer two pleats. Um, even though I fold my hackama carefully after each training session, everything else is fine. Just the upper part of the pleats, uh, the rims get curled outwards a bit. Uh, have you ever seen that? And if so, do you have any tips to stop it from happening? Yeah, um, it's a particular trait with cotton hackama. Um, basically, uh, you won't find it with like the Gaia Hakama that we do, the, the, the stitched into place on the outside. But with, with sort of heavier cotton Hakama, it happens sometimes because essentially you put it on right, and even though you're folding it upright and everything, when you put your tare on, you're tying the tare underneath the uh, the ore daddy, the, the, the big, uh, the ore daddy is the big, the big panel. You tie it and then you tuck it up under. And what you're doing is you're just tucking up the knot underneath the um the the panel it kind of pushes the edges of those pleats out that way and then they get folded out that way and then the the tally sits on top of it and it kind of folds and leaves and folded out that way and that's why they get to curl around like that so to fix that the, it, it's a bit tough it happens to me as well sometimes but what you have to do is when you tie your tally and you tuck the knot underneath the tara obi up towards the tara obi that way just make sure that underneath the 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 pleats are sat sitting flat before you put the tally panels back down and into place before you put the door on uh, and that should should do something to prevent it of course you're then going to get up and start moving around so it's possible that they could still shift around a little bit but i mean that part's covered by the tally anyway so it's not such a a, a major problem uh, but that's the best way to deal with it if that makes sense <clears throat> Uh, next one, have you ever considered uh, selling the Vanguard Basic Kote as a standard lineup? It's great kit, you know. <laughs> so last month we uh, we had some uh, basic versions of the Vanguard series uh, Borger. Uh, we, we sort of stripped that back on all of the um, kind of sort of flashy features on. There's no flashy features on, it's just a pair of Kote, but we made them with Orizash fabric instead of uh, Clarino, just a standard uh, Kazari pattern on the, the fist um, with the same foot on. Um, so we could put them out at the lowest possible price. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, they were really, really popular. So, you know, it's something that we are considering uh, potentially bringing back in the future. Um, they don't offer quite the same durability or comfort as this, the regular Vanguard ones do, but they are a really great price. So it might be something we come come back to uh, at some point in the future. Uh, next, I'm an aspiring Jordan player and I'm interested in the Jordan Shinai from Kendo Star. Uh, I've seen you talk about it and some of, uh, and some of your other Shinai. Sorry, I've seen you talk about some of your other Shinai, but not that one. Uh, would you mind talking about it and how it helps Jordan or Kamae? So, yeah, let me get one. Oof. Okay, here I am with the uh, Ten Taka Shinai, the Jordan Shinai uh, that we offer. It's, it's brand new off the shelf, this, so it's still in the bag. I don't want to get it out, so I don't want to dirty the uh, Tsukagawa um, as I'm demonstrating. But you can see what I mean. Uh, the actual length of the sky is very long uh, compared to a regular length. Um, a regular one is uh, probably comes to about here, so it's, it's a good inch or so longer. Um, than a, a regular Shinai. Um, <clears throat> that's because lots of Jordan players prefer to have a longer uh, tsuka, okay? Um, because when they do the Jordan no Kamae, and um, they feel like it's a more comfortable position for the right hand to be a little bit further back, try and, uh, than, than, than here. They, they, they find it more comfortable to have a little bit more space between between the hands, especially as they're generally going to be attacking with katate waza as opposed to uh, morite waza. 
um, it, uh, lots of them find that that's a more comfortable position for the hands. So that's why it's, it's a longer tukka, all right? Um, also, it's uh, it's made to be a, uh, a koto style shape, but it has a very good balance because it has the longer tukka. It feels very light, actually, because <laughs> uh, you're obviously holding it much closer to, uh, to, to the point of balance. So it, it definitely feels very light uh, when you hold it in chudan even if it feels a little bit long. Uh, but the great thing about it being kotogata is it, it's that little bit thicker um, at the tip here. So it's got that little bit more durability. So it's great for those sort of katate waza, which are a little bit harder um, to control the snap uh, for the tenuchi on. Um, so it, it does give you that little bit more <laughs> durability as well, uh, especially if you're sort of newer uh, and still sort of uh, picking up the basics of Jordan, um, as, as well as for experienced people too, I think. But um, it's a great uh, it's a great all rounder, um, I think, for uh, Jordan players. Okay, next one. Um, <clears throat> are there any unwritten or written rules in regards to tsuki during a shinsa? Uh, I've noticed while looking at shinsa videos, there's the lack of that waza. Uh, have I just seen? Uh, not seen enough videos, or is it the difficulty of the waza, the reason it's not attempted during grading? Um, there's no rules about um, written or unwritten about using tsuki in grading. And the thing about doing a grading though is you're you're trying to you're trying to demonstrate something in your grading, yeah. Now whether that's your technical ability um, or your ability to uh, create. Uh, and take advantage of opportunities by taking the initiative or the sen at higher levels. Um, that's not something that's going to be showcased particularly well in most situations by the use of tsuki. Um, you're much better looking at trying to do men, okay? <laughs> Generally, if there's an opportunity for tsuki, there's also a good opportunity for men as well. Um, so it's not that there's any rule against it or not. It's just not a great strategy for showing off what you want to show to a grading panel. Um, because no one's like, if, you, if you're looking at like up to Sandan, that's really all about technical ability. Nobody's looking on a grading panel to see how good your ski waza is. They want to see if you can make good men strikes, to be honest. Um, and then if we're talking about sort of fourth dan, fifth dan and above, then we're start, starting to talk about creating opportunities, taking the initiative, taking the send. There are some specific instances where uh, potentially um, ski might be the most appropriate waza, um, but they're very, very, very rare <laughs> um, in a grading situation or scenario. Um, so I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying that it's it, it's probably not always the best choice of waza to show off what you want to necessarily show off. It's a little bit like hiki waza. There's not a lot of tsubazeriai that happens in uh, gradings, um, but it doesn't mean that um, that you should never do hiki waza in the grading. Um, it just means that it should be done at the right opportunity and that that opportunity doesn't always or very often doesn't very often uh, make itself uh, present <laughs> next one um, um how can i make my kakegoe more varied uh, i always i can always be louder and i keep practicing that but right now i only yell yeah uh, which kind of gets predictable and boring um to be honest, I don't think you need to worry about making it more varied. It's fine to shout yeah, first of all. Uh, I shout yeah, I think. Um, don't worry too much about what you're shouting. No one's kind of thinking, oh, well, that's a bit boring. or That's a bit predictable. Um, just don't, you know, don't worry too much about that. That isn't really what it's there for. It's there to help you raise your own spirits and your own uh, energy, uh, as well as impress them onto your opponent. So for me... Yeah, is per perfectly fine. Like I say, I'm pretty sure it's myself as well. Yeah, that's pretty much what I shout. So um, I, I don't think you need to worry about it too much. Next one. Um, <clears throat> uh, when choosing Shinai for Jordan and Nito, uh, what criteria can be considered? Well, uh, we already talked about the Jordan Shinai, and I think that's a great choice <clears throat> for uh, people that are uh, practicing Jordan um, because it has got the longer scale, which I think people do tend to find more comfortable. It's a great, durable, tough, uh, shinai uh, and for nito um you need to be looking obviously at the right size and weight um and to be honest it depends at what sort of stage you're at and what you want the shinai for if you want it for a lot of tournaments then you could get like a 37 size um jisengata um we can offer the ones with thicker grips as well if you wanted something with a thicker grip um, but if it's everyday practice i'd stick with a sort of more like an all-round shinai, um, like a practice shinai or a kotogata shinai that's at a 37 size. Um, so it, it fits obviously in with the regulations. Um, 
you, you could as well obviously look at oval grips. Um, if it's something, you know, if you if you're worried about <clears throat> whether your hasuji is is definitely correct or not, um, oval grips are obviously a great choice as well. So uh bang us an email, mail at kendostar.com <laughs> uh, and we'll definitely be able to chat chat to you about um more specific requirements. Uh, next one, uh, I had the privilege of attending the Mameshi 3's Taikai this Saturday and I really enjoyed myself and I must say you did a fantastic job as Shimpan that day. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> uh, could you please uh, explain the concept of awarding Hansoku in a Taikai environment? Keep up the good job and looking forward to your future videos. Thank you very much. So, um, Hansoku means a penalty. Uh, there's various situations where that could occur. The most common one is Jogai, jogai Hansoku. That's when you step out of the Shiaijo. Um, so one of the players has to put um, any part of their body um, outside of the Shiaijo on the floor. Um, Except the sole of the foot, it has to be the entire the, the sole of the foot, the entire sole of the foot has to be out of the floor. Um, that's supporting the weight. Okay, so if if only half of your foot is over the line, um, or even just your little toe is on the line, you're still in. Uh, but if you fall over and uh, your shoulder goes over the line and your shoulder touches the floor, you, that counts as out. So it's a little bit of a grey rule, actually. not grey, but it's a bit of a difficult uh, rule to definitely understand um there's other ones as well dropping the shinai that's hansoku uh they're the most common ones um also wasting the time uh that's hansoku or not doing proper tsubazeri ai refusing to engage in tsubazeri ai uh that's hansoku um aggressive acts where you, you you're too rough um try to hurt the other person or hit them in in the area where they don't have a borgo um being rude uh, towards the other person or to the shimpan uh, that can result in hansoku um, as well. Uh, and basically the way it happens is uh, depends on, on the situation. If it's a very obvious hansoku like the jaw guy where they step out uh, or they go out, uh, the first the flag is signaled uh, diagonally down uh, to the way, to the side, sorry. If it's the red player, it'd be to the red side. And if it's a white player, to the white side, the person that's committed the foul. Uh, it's the kind of opposite to the, the Ippon. Ippon is up here. Hansoku is down 45 degrees to the left or right. Uh, the Shushin would call Yame. Um, and if it's obvious one, everyone agrees, like they've stepped out. Uh, he would also signal that. And then he would say to the player that's that's uh, performed the Hansoku, Hansoku guy, which is the first Hansoku. Um, if you get two Hansoku, then a point is awarded to the other side. Um, so on the second instance, he'd say Hansoku Nikai, uh, and then he'd hold the uh, he or she would hold the flag uh, in the motion for Ippon towards the opposite side. So Ippon Ali, uh, and award Ippon to the uh, the opponent. Okay. Um, more difficult to ascertain Hansoku things like um, rough play or bad subazeriai, bad subazeriai, for example, um, that's actually quite complicated. It's not complicated, but the Shushin is, uh, in this case, the only person that can, the only referee that can stop the match in order to uh, call Gorgi, which is a, a meeting of the referees, um, in order to discuss Hansoku in relation to uh, incorrect subazeriai. So uh, if the if, if the Hukshin, the, the two other referees, <clears throat> there's one uh, referee who does the all the commands. He's called the Shushin. Uh, he's in charge of he he they're, they're in charge of in, in, uh, administrating the Shi'ai or, or overseeing the Shi'ai, and uh, the other two they are basically um, the, the, it's not a, there's no differentiation in power. They all they all have an equal vote. But they don't have a say as to how the Shia is administrated. They don't get to say when it starts and finishes. Um, and they don't get to, uh, generally, they don't get to call a meeting except in very specific circumstances. Um, so if there's a, if there's a, a hand soccer, if a, if a player is doing the unfair or the incorrect super um, even if the Fukushin, the, the two other referees think that it's incorrect. They have to wait for the Shushin to signal it as the Gorgi uh, so that they can then have a discussion and decide which is the Hansoku. It's a bit complicated in that respect. Uh, time wasting is the same sort of thing, actually. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay, next one. Um, 
Why are some door color options only available in bamboo? Uh, why not all colors in standard and bamboo? Okay, so that's because uh, your synthetic door, they're cast in usually plastic uh, and then they're painted um, or they're cast in colored plastic. Um, bamboo door made of bamboo, then they're covered with leather for the most part, and then they're lacquered um, using Japanese urushi of varying different types of color um, to achieve the finishes and effects that they have. That inevitably <laughs> results in a different finish, okay, in a different finish. Uh, and some of the finishes, many of the finishes that are available on bamboo can't be reproduced on a synthetic door without going to the same level of labor that it, 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 it takes to achieve them on a bamboo door. Um, so it's kind of pointless, uh, if you know what I mean. Um, so, for example, um, the some of the the Sakuragawa nuri, for example, it's supposed to look like the bark of a cherry cherry tree. That's hand painted. Um, it takes a long time, a lot of uh, effort in genuine urushi. Uh, they're not going to go to that. They're not going to enact that labor onto a plastic door. Um, and even if they did, it would cost a similar amount because what you're paying for for a large amount part of it isn't the bamboo slats it's the work that's been put into completing the finish of the door um so uh that's the main reason for it the the plastic ones or the synthetic ones they're kind of mass produced um they're sprayed um with a usually with a spray can not a spray can but like a spray you know like they do for cars and stuff like a spray gun or something um or, or the mold molded in that plastic color um, so there's, there's such a big difference in the way that they're produced. Uh, you just can't achieve the same finishes. Kijido as well, a Kijido, yellow Kijido is covered with leather, um, which is essentially, it's a bamboo door. It's covered with some canvas and then it's covered with raw hide leather. And that's why it's that yellow color. Um, you can't, I mean, they could make that out of a plastic door, but again, it just would, it wouldn't, um, wouldn't work in the same way. All right, um, you, you'd end up with a plastic door still with the leather on the front, um, and it wouldn't it wouldn't change the cost a massive amount, uh, to be honest. Um, I mean, it it, it it would a little bit, but you know, it, they're they're not going to go to that labour over uh, you know to do it uh, onto it onto a plastic door. So that that's why it's not um, it, it's not available on on both with all all finishes. If that makes sense. Okay, next one. Um, could you elaborate on the do's and don'ts of striking an opponent that fell on the floor? Um, if it's Jigeko and someone falls on the floor, you don't need to hit them. <laughs> uh, you can if you want, uh, but you know, be, you know, you don't need to be like crazy about it. Don't have to be like ruthless. <laughs> um, but um, if, if you're talking about in Shi'ai, generally you get until the referees say yame and they usually give you, a, you know, just a couple of seconds to take advantage of that. Um, if you're going to hit someone whilst they've fallen on the floor, um, make sure you do it on their borgu if you can. <laughs> Try, you know, that's the difficulty of uh, striking an opponent on the floor. It's not a usual uh, point at which we attack someone. Um, of course, you want to try and get the Ippon, uh, but unless you're very confident that you can strike their borgu accurately, um, then it's it's incredibly unlikely that you're going to be awarded Ippon for it. Um, so I'm not saying don't do it, do it if you're confident you can make an accurate strike that will meet the criteria of Yuko Datotsu. If you're not confident of that, then um, you're, you're risking injuring somebody, um, which is it's quite possible to do because they kind of, you know, people fall over and they're like this. You smash them as hard as you can on the elbow and shout Kote. Um, it's not such a nice nice thing to do, you know? <laughs> uh, I mean, I know in Shi'ai everything goes and all that sort of thing, but... Um, you have to be aware of your own ability at the same time. Um, so if you, you know, uh, if you think, if you think, you know, you can make a, you've got a good chance of making a, a valid strike at that point, then take it, uh, take the opportunity immediately. Uh, but don't, don't put your, your opponent at risk uh, for the sake of it. Um, in my opinion, uh, of course. Uh, right, next one. Uh, how to keep getting better and develop my kendo when I'm, when I'm not a student anymore? Uh, because my job and family, it's difficult to practice as often as I used to. Uh, how, do I, how do I keep up? Uh, I'm yondan na now, uh, and I feel that my kendo changes as I get older, simply because uh, I'm maturing, if you like. Uh, but I'd still like to know what to focus on. 
look, it's totally normal, totally normal. Um, it's really hard to continue your Kendall progression uh, whilst also living a normal life uh, of work, family, <clears throat> that sort of thing. Um, however, um, if you're already at Yondan, you've already got a good sort of base. Um, I think the best thing to do, and this is what I'm doing as well, uh, is probably you only get to practice a handful of times um, a, a week or even a month. But you mustn't stray away from the kihon, okay? Basic ashisabaki, correct suburi, correct kirikaishi. Um, and trying your best to do that correctly, yeah? Uh, if you do that, it will help the rest of your kendo. You don't need to practice fancy waza, gyakudo, or, you know, uh, you know hiki, hiki, kaishi, Aigo de men or something like that, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you can you just focus on the basics um, and I think you'll gain a lot more from it. For also, um, as much Mitori Geiko as you can do uh, realistically, um, take a look at the analysis videos that we put out on usually on a Friday um, and try to remember the stuff that you see in your Mitori Geiko at the practice when you go to it and try and keep it in your mind to try to try to implement it during your actual practice. I really think that's the key to improving as an, uh, uh, what in Japan would be called a shakaijin, or like a, a normal member of society, not a student, not like a, a, a like a, a police officer that just does kendo, um, or like a, you know, like just a normal person just doing the work, you know, going to a job, looking after their family, that sort of thing. Um, I think that's the, the best way to focus on your improvement, if that makes sense. Next one. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, Andy. I've been practicing Kendo for nearly a year now, along with my six-year-old son. I'm 38, and I'd like your advice. Uh, starting at this age, how far can one get in Kendo? What's the best way to for What's the best way forward first, and and perhaps beyond? How to structure my training to get m the most of it, given that I have a family and work, etc. Apart from Kendo practice, do you have any advice other than particular gym or uh, or any other uh, gym or cardio exercises to stay fit? Uh, that helps Kendall. Right. No, I don't know anything about uh, gym or cardio or stuff like that that can help Kendall. Um, probably it does, um, but I'm not the right person to answer questions on it. So I, I, I kind of try to stay away from that sort of thing. Um, however, if you're 38, uh, you've been doing it for a year now. Uh, realistically, um, it's possible uh, to get to like uh, second, second or third dan, uh, like second dan, easy, certainly second dan by the time you're 40. Um, you could get to uh, like um, like fifth or sixth dan by your sort of uh, 50s. And then, uh, yeah, seventh, seventh and eighth dan is possible. Um, I think you'd be eligible. I think I worked it out before. You'd be eligible for seventh dan, if you if you you know if you did your best and you were able to progress uh, quickly um, and you worked hard at it, um, it's possible uh, for you to achieve sixth dan uh, by the age of sixty, uh, which is not an old age. That's a perfectly there's plenty of people that pass sixth dan at that age um, and older. Uh, and then you'd be looking to challenge. Uh, I think actually seventh dan more like is actually at around sixty. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's more like it. Yeah, you'd be able to challenge 7th Dan at around 60 and you'd be looking to be able even to challenge 8th Dan um, at around 70. And there's plenty of people that are over 70 that pass 8th Dan. So um, how far you can actually get is, is kind of limitless. Now, realistically, look, uh, if you're 38 already, you're just starting, you're just a year in. Uh, if you haven't got Shodan yet, first Dan yet, then probably something like international competition, like on your national team, that might be a little bit of a challenge depending on what country you're in. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible though, depends, but, um, there's, you know, it, it's definitely not like, it, it's not like a stage where, oh, it's a write-off and you can't, you can only get to first down and that's it. You can get well beyond first down. You could get well into your sort of, uh, fifth down, sixth down. I think that's a easily re realistic, um, uh, sort of idea for you to be able to achieve, uh, without, without, you know, a problem at all. Um, in, in terms of what to work for for first dan, work on hitting with fumikomi, 
Okay, so hit, stamp, and shout at the same time, all right? If you can do that, you should be able to pass first down. That's the biggest reason people fail first down, is that they can't do, uh, let's say, kirikaishi. They're, they're not at the stage where they can do kirikaishi, where they hit and stamp and shout at the same time together correctly with kikentai no ichi. That's all you've got to be able to do, all right? Sounds easy, it's quite hard though. I've got a video series called Kendo Zero to Shodan though that's on its way. I'm, I'm up to episode two already, that's live on YouTube. So go and check that out if you haven't seen it already. Uh, episode three is in the works and we've got more and more coming soon too. So make sure you tune into that. Uh, okay, next one. Uh, what's the best way to remove the smell of funk from a burger? Uh, sweat stains or best practices for keeping your burger clean? Uh, not for me, asking for a friend, LOL. <laughs> okay, so... Um, in terms of removing sweat stains, I did a video about that. Search, go to the search bar, put uh, the Kendo Show Borgo sweat stains. And there's a like a, a 30 second video or something, I think, or a minute video showing you exactly how to do that. It's actually super easy. Um, about removing the actual smell, you just got to air it out. And you can actually, like the kote, uh, usually the stinkiest thing. Um, you can wash them. I've got a video how to do that as well. Go to the search bar, the Kendo Show Wash Kote. That will come up. It'll tell you how to wash your kote. Um, and just make sure that you like... And some people say like spraying it with alcohol and stuff like that. I've never done anything like that personally. Uh, I'm not saying my burger doesn't stink though, because it probably does. But uh, <laughs> um, to, to, you know, to kind of keep it as, as you know, um, as not stinky as possible. Um, Take it out of the bag after you use it. Make sure you leave it out to dry completely um, before you use it again the next time. Um, and that's that's the best thing you can do, to be honest. Uh, next one. Uh, when you get a chance to have a cake or with high-ranking senseis, what's the best way to get the most from it? What should one focus on in relation to his or her experience level? i.e. tips for Q grades, first down, second down, third down and above. Also, how do you personally approach it and what uh, purpose do you have in mind? Okay, so here's my opinion on this, right? If somebody is, uh, somebody is like, um, I'd say uh, two down grades or more above you, then you should uh, treat that as a sensei keiko. So, um, you should not be looking to compete with them. It's not the Gokaku Geiko. Um, you should be looking to uh, try and give your best spirit, try to overcome your fears of being hit and try to make uh, positive attacks with Temi. So that means don't bother with Ojiwaza. Um, I just try and hit, like if I practice with the eighth dan sensei uh, or even the seventh dan sensei, I, I, I don't use Ojiwaza um for the most part i just use uh, especially with the hachidan i just i just use the uh, um shikaki waza and to be honest i just hit try to hit men um i just try to hit i, I try to find the opportunity that sensei is uh gonna let me have because probably i can't make one on the sensei uh i have to try and hopefully he'll try he they will allow me one <laughs> uh, and then i'll try to make an attack with full stemmy everything maybe i'll lose the dabana waza or the kaisha waza i have to try and not care about that not care about um how i'll feel if if they strike me uh, or not succumb to my own desire to make a successful strike just try to overcome all of that and try to make positive waza with stemmy all right, so shikake waza, mainly men, uh, is what you should be doing uh, with the sensei, okay? So um, it doesn't matter what grade you are. If you're Q grade, if you're first dan, second dan, or third dan, if somebody's like, if you're third dan, if somebody that's like fifth dan and above, um, you should definitely do that, all right? Um, if you're like fourth dan, um, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated, but still, I think if somebody's like, it depends on the person that you're practicing with as well. But, you know, I think really um, that's the best way you're going to improve. Um, for me, like, I generally think pe senseis that are like seventh down and eighth down, I try to treat that as sensei keiko um, rather than the kind of gokaku geiko where I'd be trying to compete with them or try to fight them on a, a, an equal basis. Um so yeah, that's the that's the way to go with that. Okay. Um, next one, uh, and this is the last one. Uh, I'm I'm practicing kendo with my 13 year old son at, at our excellent local club. Uh, we've only uh, been going since July. 
Currently, the other attendees are all adults, which makes him feel a little bit awkward and alone at times. Do you have any suggestions for how we can encourage other children to try and also engage with Kendall? Uh, thank you for my excellent uh, for your excellent videos. Uh, my son is excited and impatient about his Vanguard Junior Super Protective Burger, which we have on order. He even put all of his savings towards it. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, we'll do our best to get that to him as soon as we can. So look, uh, I can really relate to this because I've got two kids uh, that do kendo here in the UK at the moment. Um, and they came out of a dojo in Japan that was just mainly kids. Um, and now it's mainly adults. <laughs> uh, and there are no other kids really in, in, in the dojo. Um, it's hard, I think, uh, to um, encourage kids to come to kendo because kendo is quite tough. It's quite hard. Um, it's different. To how a lot of them imagine it as well especially with all the shouting and stuff um and i think it's a bit of a barrier for parents to get over as well um i think the thing is is one thing is yeah definitely you have to try and encourage um other kids to come to kendo you can try by uh trying to get a awareness perhaps with uh your son's friends uh it'd be a good place to start if there's any of his friends that are interested in kendo um from school or something like that or or you know even if you could put a poster up at the school or something uh social media as well of course um is a great way um to to sort of raise awareness and stuff like that um and of course talk to the teacher the club uh, see if they've got any ideas too uh, and secondly um i'd encourage your son to not be too uh kind of you know, to, not to feel too awkward about it. It's very normal, actually, for kids outside of Japan his age uh, to be in this situation. Um, and, you know, what's important is the other people in the dojo realize that they shouldn't be hitting the kids as in the same way as they're hitting the adults. They shouldn't be practicing with the kids in the same way as they are the adults. They're not competing with the kids. Um, and they're there to help the kids feel um, safe. Uh, and able to practice. Okay, I make a very, very strong point of that uh, in my club or whenever I take my daughters to the dojo. Look, these are just kids. You don't hit them as hard um, as you do everyone else. Just be accurate. Even if the shinai just touches the ball for now, accuracy is is important, uh, but you don't need to hit them hard uh, because they're only small. They feel intimidated by big, scary guys, of course, um, that sometimes they have to practice with. Um, and you know, you need to treat them with kindness. So that's something as well. I think you need to ra raise awareness of within the dojo itself, um, just to help, help him feel a little bit more uh, comfortable, but you know, I mean, he's 13. Uh, so, you know, give it a couple of years and like, he's going to be kind of a similar size to most of the guys there anyway, I'm sure. So, um, I, I think it's only a sort of interim problem that you'll be facing anyway. So, um, I hope that helps. Uh, and we'll do our best to get his, his burger to him as soon as we can anyway. So, uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for watching for today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget, like, share, subscribe, join the Kendall Show Early Access, to, uh, Early Access Group. Links in the description down below and shop at Kendall Star. See you all next time. Bye-bye.